A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis. This video is brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 2nd of September 2022. Now before looking into the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today, I have an announcement for you. See the pre storming test series batch 1 is going to start in Ananagar. Starts on 12th of September 2022 and the first test will be on 19th of September 2022. The series will be covering 66 tests which also includes general studies, CSAT and 3 mock tests. All the tests will be conducted in offline mode on the scheduled dates from 2 pm to 4 pm followed by live discussion from 4.30 pm to 7.30 pm. The students who missed the offline test can take the test after 2 days in online and they will be provided with recorded discussions. The availability of online mode test is until our mock test before prelims 2023 examination. The explanation key will also be provided to the students. So with this announcement, now let's look into the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. We have six different news articles. We have almost covered everything in today's news article. Like we have an article regarding art and culture. Then we have a science article. Especially we have an open article which is an interview given by two retired officers of government of India. So without much delay, let's get into the news article discussion. Now look at this first news article. Have a look at this open article. See this article is written in the backdrop of a recent issue that was triggered by a comment made by an IAS officer. See a senior IAS officer of Telangana, she tweeted her opinion about the release of 11 convicts of Balkis Banu case. Immediately this triggered a debate of can a civil servant comment on a decision of a state government or not. So this issue is what discussed in this open article where two senior retired officials of government of India has shared their opinion. One among them is the retired judge of the Supreme Court, Justice B.N. Sri Krishna, we will call him as B.N.K. in short. And the other officer is a retired IAS officer K. Sujata Rao. See here their opinion is of utmost importance to us. Because they both know how the government or judiciary functions and how the tweet of the IAS officer will be viewed. So without much delay, now let us get into the discussion. Now recently what happened was, as part of celebrating India's 75th Independence Day, certain category of convicts was asked to be released by central government. Following this, the Gujarat government released the 11 convicts of Balkis Pono case. It was done after a recommendation by a panel appointed by the Gujarat government. So here their sentence of life imprisonment was remitted totally based on a 1992 remission policy of the Gujarat government. This release triggered public anger and a senior IAS officer of Telangana, she tweeted from her personal Twitter account in support of Ms. Balkis Banu and questioned the Gujarat government's decision. Well, this started the debate of can a civil servant question government's decision publicly or not. It was stated that the officer breached central civil service conduct rules of 1964. See, these rules lay down clear principles as to what the government expects from its employees and it applies to both official and personal life of the government servant. So, if an official violates conduct rules, he or she may face disciplinary action or departmental proceedings. So, what is the rule they are particularly talking about? It is the rule number 9. See, the rule bars or prohibits criticism of government by a government servant. It says that government servant shall not make any statement which has the effect of an adverse criticism of any current or recent policy or action of the central government or a state government. Apart from this, they also cannot make a statement which is capable of embracing the relations between the central government and the government of any state or relations between the central government and the government of any foreign state. 
Here the statement could be any radio broadcast, telecast through any electronic medium or a statement made in any document. The government servant cannot make such a statement either in her own name or even anonymously or pseudonymously or in the name of any other person also. Okay. The same is applicable in case of any communication to the press or in any public utterance. So from this rule, it is clear that the government servants just simply cannot criticize the government, its policy or its decision and therefore it curtails their freedom of speech. So can we say here article 19 is violated by this rule? See this is where the trick is. On the face of it, one may argue the rule curtails their fundamental rights. But we know the right to freedom of speech and expression is subject to reasonable restrictions, right? A reasonable restriction can be imposed by a law on this right. So does the rule 9 imposes a reasonable restriction on the freedom of speech of government servants? To find the answer for this question, let us look into what the retired officer have to say. First, let us see the observations of BNK. His first observation is being a civil servant. The IAS officer has to follow disciplinary rules including the rule 9. So she is prevented from expressing herself freely with regard to anything that has to do with the governance of the country. He also has the view that the rule reasonably restricts the fundamental right of freedom of speech. Even the retired IAS officer K. Sujata Rao, she agrees that the rule does not violate article 19. It is only because the rules are necessary to maintain discipline in any organization. Now comes another question. Does the rule violate the right to object or right to dissent? Here both the retired officers, they agree that a government servant has the right to object or a right to dissent. But whether the rule bars this right or not is a question that need to be addressed by the Supreme Court. So now regarding the tweet, their opinion is, it has to be seen on a case by case basis because Balkis Banu case was a travesty of justice. So releasing the convicts is a mockery of law and a civil servant who has to uphold the law being angered by this move has to be taken as an exception. And simply we cannot decide that the IAS officer breached the rules. So these were the observations of both experienced officers. So now, as a conclusion, while dealing with the matter relating to Rules 9, the Supreme Court has to keep in mind certain factors. First, the contact rules were made way back during the British time when there was no social media and when the British wanted to exert control over the officers. So it is time to revisit these rules and update it to the current requirement. While doing so, they can also mention whether the civil servants can comment in social media platform or not. Second, it has to kept in mind that India is a democratic country. So the government should rule within the limits set by constitutional law and citizens rights. The right to criticize the government is a fundamental right inherent in article 19. The same applies to civil servants also. See, I'm saying this based on a judgment of Kerala High Court in 2018. The case is Prasad Panian versus Central University of Kerala. Here the High Court held that one cannot be prevented from expressing his views merely because he is an employee. In a democratic society even institution is governed by democratic norms. Healthy criticism is a better way to govern a public institution. So, if criticism is necessary for a public institution, Government of India is the biggest public institution of India. So, a civil servant who is an employee of this public institution has the right to criticize also. But again, this can be restricted only on the grounds mentioned in the constitution. So, the conclusion here is the government has to reconsider this rule and make necessary amendments to protect the basic and fundamental rights of government servants. So this news article is very very important news article. In GS paper 2 exclusively we have a topic called role of civil servants. Again in ethics paper also we have many topics with respect to code of conduct and conflict of interest. So you can use these points as an example in your main science writing. So in this news article discussion we saw in detail about 
can a civil servant comment on a decision of state government or not so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this news article talks about the indian made hpv vaccine see it is india's first indigenously developed vaccine to prevent cervical cancer its name is servavac and is likely to cost rupees 200 to 400 per shot and it will be commercially available later this year also this servavac which is developed by sia was approved by the drug controller general of india in july so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us discuss about this hpv vaccine in prelims perspective see hpv vaccines protect against infection with human papilloma virus that is hpv now before knowing about the vaccine let us have a brief understanding about the virus first see hpv is a member of the family papilloma viridae they are small non enveloped deoxyribo nucleic acid that is dna viruses this human papilloma virus is a group of more than 200 related viruses of which more than 40 are spread through direct sexual contact among these two hpv types cause genital warts genital warts or soft growths that appear on the genitals they can cause pain discomfort and itching okay and about a dozen of hpv types can cause certain types of cancers like cervical anal vulvar and vaginal okay know that nearly 83 percentage of invasive cervical cancers in india and 70 percentage of cases worldwide are attributed to hpv types 16 or 18 and when you ask about the transmission of this virus see the virus transmission is influenced by sexual activity and age almost 75 percentage of all sexually active adults are likely to be infected with at least one hpv type a vast majority of the infections resolve itself and only a minority that is less than 1 percentage of the hpv infection progress to cancer okay when you take india alone annually 1.25 lakh women are diagnosed with cervical cancer and over 75000 die from the disease so cervical cancer is ranked as the most frequent cancer in women in india and remember hpv is a necessary cause of cervical cancer but it is not a sufficient cause which means other cofactors are necessary for progression from cervical hpv infection to cancer for example long term use of hormonal contraceptives high parity early initiation of sexual activity multiple sex partners tobacco smoking and co infection with hiv or identified as established cofactors so all these cofactors might lead hpv infection to hpv cancer okay so with this basic understanding now let us see about the vaccine first of all why vaccine is required see currently all genital hpv infections cannot be prevented exactly by abstinence and lifetime mutual monogamy that is just by stopping to have sexual relationship with partners and when two partners agree to be sexually active with only one another this hpv infection cannot be prevented this is because there is no clear evidence that barrier methods of contraception most notably use of condoms confer a protection against hpv infection secondly except for genital warts the infection is asymptomatic see susceptible female population have to adhere to routine screening through periodic pap smears a pap smear also called a pap test is a procedure to test for cervical cancer in women a pap smear involves collecting cells from cervix that is the lower narrow end of uterus which is at the top of vagina but the issue here is this method has been unsatisfactory even in developed countries so where in developing countries like india large scale routine screening is very difficult to achieve so because of these two reasons vaccine is needed for hpv now coming to the indian made hpv vaccine see in general the recombinant dna technology is used to express the l1 major capsid protein of hpv in yeast and this will self assemble to form empty shells resembling a virus called virus like proteins or vlps 
See, regarding this VLP only, yesterday Kitana ma'am explained in detail. So, I'm not going to explain about it here. If you want a clear understanding, click this link and do watch the topic. Now, coming back, these VLPs have the same outer L1 protein coat as HPV, but they do not contain any genetic material. The vaccine uses these VLPs as antigens to induce a strong protective immune response. So, if an exposure occurs, the vaccinated person's antibodies against the L1 protein will coat the virus and prevent it from releasing its genetic material. Okay? And remember, so far in India, we have two HPV vaccines. They are available in the private market presently. Both are made by foreign companies only. So, this is for the first time India is making HPV vaccine indigenously, which is called as Servavac. This is a quadrivalent vaccine. That means it is effective against at least four variants of cancer-causing human papilloma virus, that is HPV. This quadrivalent HPV vaccine works against type 6, 11, 16, 18. Know that HPV type 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, 58 are considered as high risk for cancer. Type 6 and 11 are considered low risk types. And remember this Indian made HPV vaccine that is Servavax is developed by DBT's Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council that is BIRAC and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that supported serums development efforts. And also know that this vaccine should be given in two doses for 9 to 14 year olds and three dose scheduled for 15 to 26 year olds. So that's all about this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about what is HPV virus, its transmission. Then we saw why a vaccine is needed for HPV virus. And we also saw some of the specifications of Servavac. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article from the Friday review page. The title of the article is For a Space of Their Own. See, this news article talks about the struggles of the Kathakali artist in Kerala to find the space of their own to perform the art form. So, in today's news article discussion, we are going to see in detail about Kathakali, which is one of the important classical dances in India. So, remember, Kathakali is one of the eight classical dances recognized by Sangeet Natak Academy. Here, Sangeet Natak Academy is the apex body in the field of performing arts in the country. Or in simple words, it is the national level academy for performing arts set up by the government of India. Okay. So, what about the other seven classical dances? They include Bharatanatyam, Kuchipudi, Mohiniyattam, Odissi, Manipuri, Kadak and Satriya. So, including Kadakali, these are all the eight classical dances as recognized by Sankit Natak Academy. On the other hand, the Ministry of Culture has recognized nine classical dances which include Chow dance as well. Okay. Now, coming back to the dance form which is Kadakali. Firstly, know that the term Kadakali derives its name from two words, Kada meaning story and Kali meaning drama. So, Kadakali is nothing but the combination of these two words. Kadakali originated in 18th century AD and today it is a very popular form of dance. And remember it is an art which has evolved from many social and religious theatrical forms which existed in the southern region from ancient times. And it is said to have evolved from other art forms like Kudiyatam, Krishnanatam and Kalaripayat. So here Kudiyatam is the oldest surviving Sanskrit theatre in India. While Kalari Paita is the oldest martial art form of India. Okay. And the present form of Kadakali was revived in the first half of the 20th century by the poet Vallathol Narayana Menon and Mukun Raja of Kerala. See, these two men also established Kerala Kalamandalam. This serves as an exclusive training center for Kadakali. Now it is transformed into a premier art university which is located in Trishur, Kerala. So now coming to the language of the art form, see Mani Pravalam, which is a combination of both Sanskrit and Malayalam is the language in which the background songs are played during the performance of Kadakali. Also remember, traditionally performance of Kadakali is exclusively done by men and young boys. They play the parts of both male and female. Now coming to the theme of Kadakali, see the theme of Kadakali is the battle between the good and the evil. 
So just to symbolize these, different colors are used with their own significance like green for heroes, kings and divinities while red and black for evil and fairs. Now coming to the time of the play, see the performance of Kadakali starts in the evening after an invocatory drumming using chenda and madala and concludes only at daybreak. Now talking about the features of Kadakali, see the features includes the presence of huge headgear and elaborate makeup. In no other dance style is the entire body used so completely as in Kadakali. Which is something unique about Kathakali. The technical details cover every part of the body from facial muscles to fingers, eyes, hands and wrist. Some features like the moment of eyebrows, the eyeballs and the lower eyelids as described in the Natya Sastra were not used in any other dance style. So this is also something unique about Kathakali. So here facial muscles they play an important part in Kathakali to bring out the nine important facial expressions called Navarasa. So these are all some of the very important points that you have to note both in the perspective of prelims as well as mains. In prelims there might be questions regarding terms and in mains GS paper 1 we exclusively have art and culture. So there also you can use it as an example or a value addition. So in this news article discussion we saw in detail about Kathakali. So with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now let us take up this data point for our news article discussion. See this data point is about the unknown sources of funding received by the political parties in the year 2021. See the data is compiled by the Association for Democratic Reforms. So let's start our discussion by seeing some of the facts about ADR which is nothing but Association for Democratic Reforms. See, ADR is a non-governmental organization which works in the area of electoral and political reforms. It was established in 1999 by a group of professors from the Indian Institute of Management that is IIM Ahmedabad. So its objectives include eliminating corruption and criminalization in the political process, empowering the electorate through greater dissemination of information relating to the candidates and the parties. This is done to ensure that the electorate makes informed decisions. Its third objective is to ensure accountability from the political parties. And finally, ensuring democracy and transparency within the political parties is also objective of ADR. So having seen about some of the important facts about ADR, now let us see what the data point is trying to convey. Now look at this graph. Here the blue bar shows income from unknown sources. The yellow bar shows income from known sources. And the green bar shows the income from sale of assets and membership fees. By looking at the graph, we can come to the conclusion that about 50% of income for the regional parties come from unknown sources. In case of national parties, they received 31% of their income from unknown sources. Here within the income from unknown sources, there is a sub-classification. Political parties in India need not show the source of income when it received through sale of electoral bonds, sale of coupons and when the voluntary contribution is less than 20,000 rupees. Now look at this graph. The graph shows us that in the case of regional parties, income from unknown sources was mainly received through the sale of electoral bonds. In the case of national parties, the income from unknown sources was mainly received through sale of coupons and voluntary contributions. So this is all about the data point. Since ADR is a non-governmental organization which works in the area of electoral and political reforms, you can use these data in your main answer writing. So while discussing, we saw about two important terms, sale of coupons and electoral bonds. So now let us understand what are these two terms. First, let us take up the sale of coupons. See, sale of coupons is the method used by the political parties to raise money from the public in small denominations. Coupons mostly of denominations rupees 500 to rupees 2000 will be printed to collect money from the public. Now, according to election commission guidelines, cash up to the minimum amount of rupees 10,000 can be collected through the sale of coupons. So, some of the income from unknown sources for the regional parties and national parties comprises this sale of coupons. Now, coming to electoral bonds, 
See the concept of electoral bond was first introduced in 2017 in Financial Bill 2017. See electoral bonds are a banking instrument used to fund political parties. It may be purchased by a person who is a citizen of India or any corporation incorporated or established in India. And here if a person being an individual he can buy electoral bonds either singly or jointly with other individuals. And remember only the political parties registered under section 29A of the Representation of People Act 1951 and in addition to this political parties who secured not less than 1% of the votes polled in the last general election to the House of People or the Legislative Assembly of the state, they can only receive the electoral bonds. And to receive these electoral bonds, the political parties are allotted a verified account by the Election Commission. Note that all the electoral bond transactions are done through this account only. The electoral bonds can be redeemed only by an eligible political party by depositing it in their designated bank account maintained with authorized bank. So, to curb the influx of unaccounted money, the purchaser of electoral bonds would be allowed to buy electoral bonds only on due fulfill of all the existing KYC norms. KYC means know your customer norms. Note here that for purchasing electoral bonds, the payment must be made from a bank account and not through the payment of cash. And remember, electoral bonds would have a life of only 15 days during which it can be used for making donations only to the political parties. The sale of electoral bonds is only done through the State Bank of India. The face value or the denomination of the electoral bond will be rupees 1000, rupees 10,000, rupees 1 lakh, rupees 10 lakh and rupees 1 crore. So the minimum amount of denomination is 1000 and there is no upper limit. And also remember the donation made by electoral bonds will be tax deductible under section 80 GGC and 80 GGB of Income Tax Act and the benefiting political party will get a tax exemption from the amount received. Finally, note that although electoral bonds have the word bonds in it, the electoral bond will not provide any interest. Here the only issue with the electoral bond is that it does not have the name of the person who made the donation. Just have a look at this model image of an electoral bond. So if a person goes and buys electoral bond from SPI, this is what he will receive. Does it have the name of the person who purchased the bond? No, right? So the person who purchases the electoral bond can then give it to the political parties of his choice. The political party can redeem the bond by depositing it in their designated bank account maintained with authorized bank. See, political parties were brought under the ambit of RTI in 2013, so they must be transparent, right? But due to electoral bonds not having the name of the person who made the donation, it is difficult to find the source of revenue of the political parties. So this is what the data point is trying to convey and you can use all these data as an example in main answer writing. So in this news article discussion, we saw in detail about Association for Democratic Reforms that is ADR. Then we saw about sale of coupons and electoral bonds. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. This news article talks about IMF or the International Monetary Fund. See, the IMF has reached a staff level agreement with crisis hit Sri Lanka. This is the first step before extending a $2.9 billion loan package. IMF has done this after the assurance from the ILA nation's creditors. So in this backdrop, let us discuss some of the important facts about IMF in prelims perspective. Firstly, know that International Monetary Fund is an international financial institution. It consists of 190 countries and it is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Now the purpose of the IMF is to foster economic growth and employment and IMF will be doing this by providing temporary financial assistance to countries to ease the balance of payments adjustment and technical assistance. And know that countries must first join the IMF to be eligible to join the World Bank Group. And IMF is also one of the specialized agencies of the United Nations. 
See, it is just a part of the United Nations system and it is not completely under the control of United Nations. So, in order to provide analysis and forecast of economic developments and policies in its member countries, IMF releases a report called the World Economic Outlook or WEO. See, the report summarizes the current state of the global economy and it highlights the risks and uncertainty that could threaten the growth of global economy. Remember, the survey of the report begins in January and June of each year and results are published in the April and September or October. Okay. So, with these basic information, so now let us see some of the objectives of IMF. See, the primary objective of IMF is to ensure the stability of international monetary system. And apart from this, it also aims to accomplish a number of different goals like that of reducing global poverty, encouraging international trade and also to promote financial stability and economic growth. Now, having seen its objective, now let us see how the IMF functions to achieve its objectives. The IMF functions in three main areas. The first function is to oversee the economies of member countries. See, as we saw earlier, its primary aim is to promote stability in the global monetary system. So, its first function is to monitor the economies of its 190 member countries and this activity is known as economic surveillance and it happens at both the national and global levels. Second comes the lending to countries with balance of payments issue. Know that instead of lending funds to individual projects, the IMF lends fund to member countries with balance of payments problems and this assistance replenishes international reserves, stabilizes currencies and strengthens conditions for economic growth. See, Sri Lanka's present sovereign debt crisis was preceded by its balance of payments crisis but at that time, Sri Lanka did not avail the help of IMF. They thought they could manage the crisis. If you are wondering why was Sri Lanka reluctant to seek IMF's help, it was reluctant because if they seek help from IMF, then Sri Lanka has to implement some of the reforms and austerity measures proposed by IMF. Sri Lanka was not in a position to follow austerity measures as poverty in Sri Lanka has already risen due to the pandemic. But now, as the BOP crisis has turned into a sovereign debt crisis, Sri Lanka has no other choice but to get help from the IMF. So now coming back, let us see the final function of IMF. See, the third and the final function of IMF is to help the member countries to modernize their economies. And this is achieved through the capacity development which is done by providing assistance, policy advice and training through its various programs. Usually, it provides the member countries with technical assistance in the area of fiscal policy, monetary and exchange rate policies, banking and financial system, supervision, regulation and statistics. So, these are all some of the important points or the functions that you have to remember with respect to IMF. So, with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Let us take up this news article. See, this news article talks about the PM Kisan scheme. See, this scheme is in news because the Congress party demanded the government of India to stop issuing notice to farmers who is deemed ineligible under the PM Kisan scheme and the party has also urged the government to stop the recovery of the money dispersed to them. Let's not get deep into the issue here. Instead, let us learn some of the important facts about PM Kisan scheme. See, Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi is the expansion of PM Kisan. It is a central sector direct benefit transfer scheme and it is 100% fully funded by the government of India. That is 100% of funding is provided by the government of India. It took into effect from 1st of December 2018 and it was first implemented in 24th of February 2019. Remember, it is being implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. See, under this scheme, the central government transfers an amount of rupees 6,000 per year in three equal installments. This will be paid directly into the bank accounts of all the land holding farmers irrespective of the size of their land holdings. The responsibility of identification of beneficiary farmer families rests with the state government and Union Territory Administration as per the scheme guidelines. So, this is the overall idea of the scheme. 
Now let us see the objectives of the scheme. See the main objective is to provide income support to all land holding eligible farmer families. Also the scheme aims to supplement the financial needs of the farmer in procuring various inputs to ensure proper crop health and appropriate yields. Now let's know about the eligibility for the scheme. See all land holding eligible farmer families can avail the benefits under the scheme but still there are various exclusion categories for the scheme. So here I have displayed the categories of beneficiaries who are excluded from the scheme. Just go through it. Now finally talking about the advantage of the scheme. See this scheme is helping farmers to meet input cost during sowing season, to buy seeds and fertilizers at the right time and to meet some basic household needs. So these are all some of the important points that you have to make note of from this news article discussion. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice questions. Now look at this first question. See in this question one side that is on the left hand side cases have been given and on the right hand side judgments have been given. So first part Union of India versus ADR case 2002 judgment is candidates should disclose assets during nomination. Part 2 Lily Thomas versus Union of India case 2013 immediate disqualification of convicted legislators and part 3 PUCL versus Union of India case 2013 inclusion of nota in ballot papers and part 4 is yes, Swami versus ECI case 2013 VVPT indispensable for free and fair election so you have to choose the correct answer using the codes given below option a 1 2 and 3 only option b 2 3 and 4 only option c 1 3 and 4 only and option d 1 2 3 and 4 see answering questions like these are very difficult but still if you are very serious about the examination you have to solve question like these so here the correct answer is option d 1 2 3 and 4 because all the pairs are correctly matched so now moving on with reference to international Monetary Fund IMF consider the following statements. Statement 1. Special drawing rights of the IMF can be exchanged for hard currencies. Statement 2. India is a founding member of IMF. Which of the statements given above is or all correct? Option A 1 only, Option B 2 only, Option C both 1 and 2 and Option D neither 1 nor 2. See the correct answer for the question is Option C both 1 and 2. Here both the statements given here are correct. Now today take this as a task for you. Find what is the meaning of SDR and find how it works. And if you need further clarification, you can let me know it in the comment section. I will for sure explain you the concept in my next presentation. The second statement is correct because India is a founding member of IMF. So the correct answer for the question is option C both 1 and 2 because both the statements are correct. Now moving on. Consider the following statements. Statement 1. India is the first country to produce vaccine for human papilloma virus HPV. Statement 2. Human papilloma virus HPV causes lumpy skin disease. Which of the statements given above is or or incorrect? Option A 1 only, Option B 2 only, Option C both 1 and 2 and Option D neither 1 nor 2. See here both the statements are incorrect. So the correct answer for the question is Option C both 1 and 2. Statement 1 is incorrect because India is not the first country to produce vaccine for human papilloma virus. We saw that in the discussion itself, right? India recently only produced a vaccine named Servovax and it is yet to come to market. Okay? So this statement is incorrect. Statement 2 is also incorrect because human papilloma virus causes certain types of cancers like cervical cancer. Whereas this lumpy skin disease is caused by Capripox virus. Regarding this, we have covered in detail about lumpy skin disease in our 28th of August 2022 daily newspaper analysis. Just go through that to have a brief idea about what is this lumpy skin disease. Now moving on with reference to Kudi Atom, consider the following statements. Statement 1, it is the oldest surviving Sanskrit theatre in India. Statement 2, it is performed in Kutambalams which are generally built inside the temple. Which of the statements given above is or all incorrect? So here you have to choose the incorrect statement. Option A 1 only, Option B 2 only, Option C both 1 and 2 and Option D neither 1 nor 2. See the correct answer for the question is Option D because both the statements given here are correct. Statement 1 is correct because Kudi Atom is the oldest surviving Sanskrit theatre in India. 
स्टेटमेंट टू इज ऑल्सो करेक्ट बिकॉज कूतांबलम और स्ट्रक्चर्स विच आर जनरली बिल्ट इन साइड द कॉन्टर्स ऑफ द टेम्पल्स इन केरला इट इज बिल्ट स्पेसिफिकली फॉर द परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ कूडी आटम सो द फाइनल क्वेश्चन विच इज डिस्प्लेड हियर इज द क्विज क्वेश्चन फॉर यू टूडे आई एल पोस्ट द क्विज क्वेश्चन इन द पोल एज वेल यू कैन अटेंड द क्विज इन द पोल ऑल्सो सो ना मूविंग ऑन द क्वेश्चन डिस्प्लेड हियर इज द मेन्स क्वेश्चन फॉर यू टूडे प्लीज गो थ्रू द क्वेश्चन राइट एंड रेलिवेंट आंसर एंड पोस्ट द आंसर इन द कमेंट सेक्शन we will review your answer so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ai's academy youtube channel thank you